everybody. Okay. I'm Nate. Uh, feel free to stop me at any time. This is a small enough group that I can just answer your questions. If I say something that doesn't make sense, tell me I just said something that doesn't make sense, uh, and I'll be happy to try and make it make a little more sense. Um, I am a senior staff attorney on the Digital Civil Liberties team at EFF. We're a nonprofit based in San Francisco. Uh, we are 27 years old at this point, so EFF is probably older than most of all of you. Uh, we're older than the World Wide Web. Uh, and we exist to protect our digital rights uh, online and offline. So our hope, our goal, is that when you go into the digital world, your constitutional rights follow you. So we protect free speech and privacy and the rights to innovation, uh, both in the US and abroad. I've been working on encryption policy for about four and a half years at EFF. Um, I joined EFF in 2009. I did pretty much straight free speech litigation uh, at the beginning, and now I've moved more and more into policy work. Um, so I was, I was deep into crypto policy uh, when San Bernardino happened. That sort of made my work uh, become more of a household topic of conversation. So thanks for having me. I'm going to talk about the past. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to where we are today and where we might be going with encryption in the law. Uh, I'm going to talk about the legal challenges who face people who design, who implement, and who use cryptography in the United States and around the world. Um, I am a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer, so I'm not going to give you any legal advice. I'm going to try. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what we're likely to see in the future. Uh, I was taken by surprise on November 8th and we still don't really know what's happening uh, in terms of crypto and the Trump administration, but I'm gonna make some uh, predictions anyway. Jennifer Grant, former colleague of mine and now cybersecurity counsel at the ACLU, in 2016 said end-to-end -end encryption is legal, period. And she was right, and she is right. This is still true, uh, and, and we, we thank uh, we thank everything that has happened in order to get here, and we are hoping to keep this uh, true throughout 2017 and 2018 and into the future. Uh, this, Jennifer's statement, uh, was more secure in 2016 than it is today. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges that brought us here. But first, I'm going to talk about security and what security is. Uh, the story I'm about to tell you isn't actually true, uh, but it's true enough that I can that I can tell it. And then I'll later later out later on throughout this talk, I will point out the ways in which this story is not true. But from around 1784, when Joseph Bram invented a particularly good type of lever lock, which is what's behind the combination dial on this safe, there was such a thing as perfect security. It was possible to build a safe that couldn't. This lock cannot be defeated, or at least at the time it was created, it couldn't be defeated. Uh, and with the advent of overlapping steel plates, as opposed to cast iron plates, uh, the overlaps hit the rivets, uh, you could build a safe that couldn't be broken. Uh, you couldn't drill it because steel was at that point too hard to drill successfully. You couldn't blast it open because there was no such thing as hard explosives, uh, high explosives. The only thing you could do to break into a safe like that was drag it up to the top of the big building and drop it, and it would crack open. Um, and so the way that, that safe makers defeated that attack was they just built them big enough that they couldn't be dragged up buildings. So uh, it was it was secure, right? No, of course it wasn't secure. Uh, there were there were plenty of different ways uh, to break into it. And in 1851, a locksmith called Hobbes uh, broke locks or uh, broke Brandon's unpickable lock. It took him 51 hours of work to, to pick the lock, but he did it. Uh, amazingly, he did it pursuant to one of, if not the first, bug bounty that we're aware of. Uh, Joseph Bramah's store in, in central London had a, a test safe sitting out that anyone could use, and it said uh, 20 pounds to whoever cracks this safe, and that's what motivated Bramah to do it. Uh, and he did. But of course, safes were cracked all the time in the intervening 67 years between Bramah and Hobbes. 
uh, you know, you, you, you take your overlapped cast plates, or over, overlapped cast plates instead of uh, cast iron, so you hit the rivets, therefore removing that attack surface, uh, but you left the hinges on the outside of the door uh, because that wasn't part of your spec, so the plural just knock the hinges off, the door comes right off, no problem. You know, the, the implementation is where we find the security bugs. We very rarely find them in the spec. Uh, of course, we do sometimes find them in the spec, but go to fail wasn't in the spec, right? Row hammer wasn't in the spec. These things come uh, from problems in the implementation. So, one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, and the guy who wrote the GC, uh, GDB uh, debuggers for GCC, uh, my friend, Jean Gilmore, said in something like 1993, I haven't been able to find an exact date for this statement, that the internet interprets censorship as damage and rats around it. His statement is more true now than it was 20 something years ago when he said it. In 93, there was no Tor. There were no VPNs. There were barely anonymizing proxies. Uh, and there was only a hint of transport layer security. Uh, but there were words on the internet. There were lots of them. And there were images, and there was political activism, there was politics, and there was art. And for more than two decades, the internet's provided a platform where all of us can share those images, uh, can do political organizing, can contribute open source crypto code on GitHub, you name it. Uh, and in, in large part, because the internet does interpret censorship as damage and wraps around it. Of course, that imparts agency to the internet, which is the GPS and isn't actually there, but you get the picture. But in the 1990s, not only did we have the internet, we had the first crypto wars. Uh, we had an attempt by the US government to regulate that. Uh, that, of course, for, for all of you pearl wizards out there, as an implementation of RSA in Perl. And the US government decided that that was a weapon. And it was a weapon along the same lines as a landmine or a tank or a shoulder launched rocket. And you couldn't post it on the internet because then anyone from, uh, from any country around the world could download it. And that would be just as bad as if they downloaded a landmine or nerve gas. And so you had to get a license. You had to get a license to put this on the internet. Uh, just the same sort of license that you would have to get to sell machine guns uh, to, uh, to an authoritarian dictator. You'd have to get to put that in the internet. The fear was that that would turn into that. Anyone recognize what this is? Yeah. Enigma. Great. Uh, it's, so this isn't actually the whole machine, this is just a set of the code wheels. But the Enigma was the German uh, Navy's cipher during World War II. That isn't actually where it started, though. Enigma was invented to protect the European banking system. It was to protect financial transactions. Uh, and the Nazis later took it, made a couple of modifications, and came up with a device that, for a time, allowed the Nazis perfect security against uh, all allied crypto, crypto analytic attacks. Uh, it took a set of stolen code wheels a stolen box containing these uh, from a captured German submarine, the invention of the computer and the most brilliant crypto cryptographic minds in Poland and building off of the Polish work in the UK with Alan Turing to crack that. But getting back to RSA, the, the fear was that that, a cipher developed to protect banking transactions, would turn into that, a cipher developed to protect banking transactions, and that this, developed by the US, would allow, not the Nazis, but now the Soviets, perfect security against allied crypto analytic attacks. Uh, because of course the Soviets were bent on world domination and we needed to do everything uh, we could to stop them. Uh, and so what we ended up with is that. Who here was like born and conscious in 1996, anybody? Okay, a couple of you. Um, anyone remember this download screen? Oh my god, okay. Woo, you guys are young. Okay, so uh, this is the best I could find on the Internet Archive uh, from the Netscape Navigator 4.6 uh, download screen. I couldn't find any earlier ones that would still render in a modern browser, uh, which says something about the ephemerality of the Internet. 
Um, but back in the day, when you downloaded Netscape, you were presented with an option. You could either download the version that supported SSL with 40-bit RC4, or you could download the version that supported SSL with 128-bit uh, mm -hmm. RC4. Back when we still thought 128-bit RC4 was unbreakable. Uh, and you just had to click a box. If you were, if you clicked the box that said I am in the United States, you got the full version. And if you clicked the box that said I was outside the United States, you got the 40-bit version. Why? Because the uh, the, the one with 128-bit uh, RC4 was considered a munition. But the one with 40-bit RC4 wasn't. Uh, 56 bits, I think, was the uh, was the, the where the law uh, changed. So this is where we get the term military grade encryption. Because anything over 56 bits uh, was a munition. And you needed the gun, the bomb, the tank export license uh, in order to post it online. But of course, there were no GOIP blocks, there were no verifying mechanisms, there was just a checkbox. Uh, and so it led to all sorts of ridiculous stuff like that. Right? You could put it on a t-shirt and walk it through an airport, and that was perfectly legal. But you couldn't, uh, you couldn't have the, uh, the object code uh, online. It led to OpenBSD. Right? OpenBSD, at, at the time, was the, the only secure operating system. It was uh, designed by a dude named Theo Durat, who lives in Canada. And so he wasn't subject to US export control. Led to that. Anyone know what that is? Sealand! Uh, my, my friend Ryan Lackey, uh, former security engineer at Cloudflare, lived out on this thing uh, for a couple of years. And he ran a data center uh, called Inco on an anti -air, former anti aircraft platform, now a self declared country in the middle of the English Channel. Uh, of course, they were uh, they were running over a microwave link to an ISDN line uh, on on the English sea coast. So their bandwidth was a few k a second at best. Uh, so they, they they didn't really have very much uh, very many customers because of that. But one of the the biggest customers they did have were folks running uh, <coughs> encrypted software. And it led to this. This is the Clipper chip. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about why this thing was such a horribly bad idea in a few minutes. Of course, I'm a lawyer. Uh, and if all I have uh, is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. But I'm, I'm not a carpenter, I'm a lawyer. So all I have is a JD. So everything looks like a lawsuit to me and to, uh, to the Electronic Frontier Foundation where I work. Uh, this case, it's much too small for you to read, but it says Daniel J. Bernstein versus U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, my boss, Cindy Cohen, uh, was DJB's lawyer. At the time, uh, Dan was a grad student at Berkeley, and he had designed a crypto algorithm named Snow. Uh, it's not in particularly much use anymore. Dan has gone on to do much more impressive things since then, uh, but he did design an uh, one of his early designs was something called Snuffle, and he wanted to talk about it. He wanted to present this algorithm at conferences, uh, and as part of his dissertation, he wanted to publish a paper about the algorithm on the internet. Uh, and so he came into EFF and he said, is it true that US law prohibits me from posting a paper about this algorithm that I designed? And our response was yes. Uh, and so he said, okay, that's bullshit, let's sue. So we sued. And we went all the way to the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals in San Francisco. Um, and we won. Uh, we won for him. Uh, we got the regulations that declared encryption of munition declared unconstitutional uh, under the First Amendment. Because code is speech, which, uh, which we were very happy to get the Ninth Circuit to say. Uh, the Ninth Circuit, uh, in its opinion in Bernstein versus DOJ, stated that the availability and use of secure encryption may reclaim some portion of the privacy we have lost. Government efforts to control encryption thus may well implicate not only the First Amendment rights of coders, but also the constitutional rights of each of us as potential recipients of encryption's bounty. Uh, that's perhaps more flowery than I would have put it, but it's absolutely true. Uh, 
the, the fact that code is speech helps us all. Uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, a law professor down at Irvine named David Kay, uh, wrote in his report two years ago that encryption protects not only security and privacy, not only free speech, but the right to hold opinions without interference. Spree speech, privacy, security, none of those are absolute rights. We can, we can pass laws limiting each of those in some circumstances. Uh, but the right to hold opinions, the right to your own ideas, is absolute and enshrined in both US and international law. Encryption allows us to flesh out, memorialize, and store our opinions free from interference in a way that almost no other technology does. Uh, and that was just as true uh, in, uh, in 1993, uh, when PGP was, was a glimmer in Zimmerman's eyes, uh, as it is today. So going back to the names, uh, I, I showed a picture a while back of something which I called the Clipper Chip. The Clipper Chip was an NSA developed chipset that was intended to go in all of our voice communications terminals, all of our phones. It was originally intended for landline phones. They weren't thinking of mobile yet, but it was certainly on the, uh, on the horizon for them. Uh, and the Clipper Chip used the Skipjack algorithm for, uh, a, a PKI uh, system whereby you could secure all voice communications. And it included key escrow with a backdoor uh, that was accessible to the NSA. So uh, a bunch of folks in the, in the early 90s uh, got wind of this and uh, started a campaign against key escrow, saying we shouldn't have to give the government key to everything that we do, which was the point of the Clipper Chip. And so we had buttons like this, uh, that if you were nerdy enough to go to a CS department at a big fancy state university, you probably would have been wearing at the time. Uh, I was still a kid, so I was wearing this. Uh, and we had this. This was the Golden Key. Uh, that was a campaign that EFF uh, put forward uh, in 1996, I think, to get webmasters to put on their homepage in opposition to key escrow, um, back when we had home pages, as we called them. Uh, I actually went back on the Internet Archive, found my home page from 96, and it has one of these big links to get that, so I'm, I'm very proud of myself. I'm proud of 15-year-old Nate uh, for being an EFF fan, uh, even back then. Uh, and the Clipper chip failed. Thank goodness uh, we, are, we are forever grateful for the work of people like Professor Matt Blaze, uh, who deconstructed the law enforcement access field, the, the key escrow me mechanism. Uh, Matt found a way to disable the leaf. He didn't actually find a way to crack it, uh, but he surmised that such a, a, a method was, was functional, was feasible, that is. Um, and he went to Congress, and he actually testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee uh, to talk about the, the dangers of the, the clipper chips specifically and key escrow more generally. Uh, and we won. And the NSA uh, appeared at the time to have given up. And key escrow sort of went away. And we thought that we'd seen the last of it. And I'm sure you've already read and analyzed this entire block of text. Uh, assuming that you have, I can, I can say, and you'll certainly agree with me, uh, that we're all very thankful that this exists. So ECCN D502 is the encryption exception uh, to the EAR, the Export Administration Regulations. Uh, if you have uh, open source crypto today and you want to put it on the internet, all you have to do is put it on the internet. That's it. I mean, you're also supposed to send an email to the NSA uh, telling them where you put the source code. Uh, but of course, uh, a lot of people don't do that, and the NSA has never uh, gone after any coders. Um, hopefully, sometime later this year, I'll be releasing a guide and how to comply with all of this for all of you aspiring uh, cryptographers. Um, I've been, my boss assigned me to write that guide four years ago, and I haven't done it yet. So uh, maybe I will eventually. But uh, we thought we had solved the field. We won. Encryption was legal, it was exportable. Uh, our friends down in Mountain View and Cupertino are able to ship products like this that have real crypto on them by default. 
Uh, folks like Moxie Marlin Spike and Adam Langley are, are free to publish uh, the freely broad open source crypto that they do. Um, and we are all free to use them, at least here, at least in the United States. But thanks to former FBI Director Jane Comey and now his successor, Chris Ray, more work remains, and we're back to everything that everywhere that we had been before. Uh, in 1997, the, uh, the then director of the FBI said, uh, his name was Louis Free, said, we're in favor of strong encryption, robust encryption. The country needs it, industry needs it. We just want to make sure that we have a trap door and a key under some judge's authority so we can get in there if someone is committing a crime. Uh, and we heard shockingly similar rhetoric uh, in 2015 and 2016, when things like that happened. Uh, iOS now includes a couple of kinds of encryption by default. Uh, when your device is powered off, uh, the disk is encrypted, uh, and the decryption key isn't even on the phone in its entirety. A portion of it is in the secure enclave, but it needs your passcode in order to uh, assemble the decryption key to get in. Uh, WhatsApp, and iMessage, and Facebook Messenger, and Google Allo, and Telegram, all include, for some value of end-to-end -end crypto, end-to-end -end crypto of some variety. Um, and so, this pissed the hell out of Jim Comey, uh, the then director of the FBI. And Comey said, you know, plenty of companies can read users' data and unlock the phones, Encryption isn't a technical feature, it's just a marketing pitch. And what Comey did is he went to Google, he went to Facebook, he went to WhatsApp, he went to Apple, and he asked for that. He asked for key escrow. Again, just like Louis Free had. Uh, okay, what are those? Anyone know? Yeah, so those are luggage locks. So if you want to fly in the United States with a locked bag, you need to lock that bag with one of those, or with a lock that takes one of those four keys. Um, the theory being, TSA, it's a great system, uh, that only TSA had access to the keys and they would never get out. Of course, you can buy them on eBay today for 99 cents. Uh, that's the problem with key escrow. Uh, once you lock a whole bunch of stuff with the same key, and that key gets out, then, and anyone who has the key can unlock it. Uh, and that's the state where we're in today. Uh, the FBI is still, today, advocating for some version or another of that, of key escrow. Uh, and if you want to, uh, to hear why that's a bad idea, you should read this paper. Uh, this was the Keys Under Doormats paper, written in 2015, by a whole bunch of the best cryptographic minds of our generation. Uh, the paper, uh, and I'll, I'll, you all should at least read the, the first bit of it because it's damn good. And if you're uh, security engineers, you should read the whole thing. Uh, but in the intro, they state that we find it would pose far more grave security risks, imperil innovation, and raise thorny issues for human rights and international relations if we were to backdoor our crypto. Uh, and they point out three separate problems with key escrow or key escrow-like solutions. The first is that mandating key escrow would necessarily abandon some advances of the state-of-the-art of security, uh, like forward secrecy and authenticated encryption. Key escrow, depending on how you define uh, forward secrecy, almost certainly destroys the forward secret properties of the system. Second, it would necessarily increase system complexity. Right, remember back from, uh, from the safe that I was talking about at the beginning of this talk. You had perfect security in the spec, but you messed up by leaving the hinges exposed. It's not that the spec was broken, it's that the implementation was broken. And when you add key escrow, you add an order of magnitude, more or less, more, uh, more complications into the, into the implementation itself. And it gets harder and harder to successfully secure a system. And finally, it would of course concentrate attackers onto a very limited set of failure points, 
which of course have to be kept in online storage because law enforcement wants to use them a lot. And so, uh, what was what was the White House's solution uh, to the objections of cryptographers and security engineers, uh, like was evidence in he's under Darmat's paper? Um, was their solution to abandon backdoors? No, 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 no. Of course not. Uh, what Comey said was, "We're not seeking a backdoor approach. Uh, we want to use the front door." Which exactly how that works, but, but okay. Uh, the Washington Post editorial board in 2015. Uh, in its infinite wisdom, said that a backdoor can and will be exploited by bad guys too. However, with all of their wizardry, perhaps Apple and Google could invent a, a kind of secure golden key. They didn't even put that phrase in quotes. Okay. If I'm the editorial board of the Washington Post, or if I'm Jim Comey, or now Christopher Ray, this thing is pretty magical to me. I don't know how it works. And there's the old maxim that says sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, right? This is magic to people like the editorial board of the Post or the director of the FBI. They have no idea how it works. And when Apple says to them, we've secured this device so that not even we can break into it, FBI says, well, that sounds magical. Why don't you make me a magical key that allows only the FBI uh, to open it? Um, which makes sense, it makes perfect sense if you believe in magic. I personally don't. Uh, so what, what are countries resorting to? Legislation. If you can't do it in tech, just do it in law, right? That's, uh, that's always going to work. And so many countries around the world have considered or even implemented uh, such wonderful ideas as backdoors, as access to plain text, uh, or other things that really endanger encryption. I'll give you an example. Uh, in Kazakhstan, you're required to add the Kazakh National Security Agency's uh, certificate to your trust store to go online. Right? Why do you think they do that? Because they're man and milling every connection in the country. And they know that you don't do that when you access a site that their TLS man in the middle system can't crack because you haven't added their trust their certificate into your trust store. Um, but the Kazakhstan government isn't the only government around the world that's doing dumb things. Uh, the UK uh, has gone ahead and done something amazingly stupid. Uh, the, the now Investigatory Powers Act, which came out of the draft Investigatory Powers Bill, states that operators may be obligated to remove electronic protection, which is defined later in the statute as encryption, if, provide, uh, if they provided that encryption at the Home Secretary's discretion if she believes that it's practicable in her own judgment. Right? The Home Secretary of the United Kingdom is not a computer scientist, she's not a cryptographer, she's not a security engineer. So all she has to do is decide that it's practicable for Apple to, for instance, disable full disk encryption by default. I mean, it sounds reasonable, right? Uh, the UK, to our knowledge, has not yet used this provision, but they've given it to themselves. So for the past 18 months, uh, in England, it is legal for the government to demand uh, any company turn off encryption on any or all products. Uh, and of course, there's no appeals process. <clears throat> Australia uh, did something uh, possibly even dumb. Um, the, you, uh, uh, defense, oof, I'm forgetting what DSGL stands for, whatever, it's the Australian version of our EAR, Export Administration Regulations, Australian Export Control, prohibits the intangible supply of encryption technology to anyone other than an Australian citizen without the sort of license that you need to ship landmines and hand grenades. Um, how many of you don't, don't raise your hands, but I'm assuming at least one of you in this room, and in most of your classes, is not a United States citizen. Uh, that same is true, maybe even more so, in Australian universities. And there are uh, a huge number of non-Australian citizens in Australian universities. Query, there, then, how can you teach computer science in Australia today? Do you have to check the passport of every student walking in your door? Do you have to check the passport of every student checking out 
a, a cryptography textbook from the library? Uh, technically, under Australian law, yes. Uh, the uh, Department of Defense of Australia has said that they're not going to enforce the law in the university context, but they said that only after they realized that they just outlawed the teaching of mathematics on the entire continent of Australia. <laughs> Um, and of course, China has done all sorts of uh, all sorts of great stuff. Uh, the draft version of their anti-encryption bill that was uh, proposed in 2015 uh, would have required companies to maintain plain text. Uh, the version that passed later that year in 2015 doesn't require companies to maintain plain text, but says that companies shall provide technical interfaces, decryption, and other technical support. For all services offered in China. Um, that's a little bit problematic. Uh, and we thought that we may have been immune to such craziness. Um, and so we were cautiously optimistic when in 15 Obama said we will not for now call for legislation requiring companies to decode messages for law enforcement. Um, and that held for about a month, <laughs> until he, in November of 2015, uh, in a leaked National Security Council memo, so this wasn't public, but the, uh, I think it was Bloomberg actually leaked this memo pretty quickly, uh, and in it, Obama directed the National Security Council to identify laws that needed to be changed to deal with going dark. Going dark is what the FBI calls it when they can't encrypt your content. Yes, they should. They should have encrypted the memo, uh, something like that, sure. Um, and uh, and then by March of, uh, of last year, Obama had, had pretty much come around to the FBI's, and that was too bad. Uh, in the, the, the leaked memo from around Thanksgiving 2015, uh, directed at the National Security Council memo, uh, the White House suggested that public <coughs> and the encryption debate might turn in the event of a terrorist attack or criminal event where strong encryption can be shown to have hindered law enforcement. Okay, let me say we're gonna do Okay, the memo was November 2015, San Bernardino was two months later in January of 2016. And in March of 2016, or I guess it was February, February 20th, 2016, uh, the FBI sued Apple uh, for demanding technical assistance to get into an iPhone found on the scene in San Francisco. What was the case really about? Uh, if I was a cynical man, and I most certainly am a cynical man, I would think that this case was exactly what uh, the National Security Council memo uh, was hoping for. It was hoping for a terrorist attack that might turn the tide of public opinion against uh, strong crypto. Um, luckily, that's not actually what happened. Uh, so what, what did happen in, in the uh, San Bernardino case in Apple versus FBI? It was about legal precedent. And of course, I'm, I'm very biased here. I'm a lawyer talking to you about a legal case. So of course, I'm going to say it's about legal precedent. Um, but actually, I think that's true. This case was about the FBI uh, do it. Oh, let me back up for a second. Um, okay, I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We're not a legal aid group. We don't provide assistance to everyone who walks in our door. We're an impact litigation organization. We take cases where we think we can make the law better or keep the law from getting worse. We choose the cases we take very carefully based on the facts. We want to take cases where the facts aren't really in dispute, um, where, the, where the client is very sympathetic, where we can find, so like, the, the Dan Bernstein case was an ideal example. Here's a grad student who wants to publish his dissertation. Uh, and the Ninth Circuit said, of course he has to be able to publish his dissertation. The FBI in San Bernardino did a similar thing. They picked a case where the facts were pretty much undisputed. Right? The phone was not even owned by the terrorist, it was owned by the county, it was owned by his employer. The terrorist was dead. A court had signed a warrant based on probable cause to authorize the search. So everything is in the FBI's favor here, and the public is outraged that a terrorist's phone can't be opened. 
Uh, but they misread the court of public opinion. Um, they thought that even if they lost in court, they'd be able to take that court loss to Congress uh, and say, look, the courts won't give it to us. We need to pass a law demanding that they give it to us. Um, there was also a case in the Eastern District of New York, but it didn't go anywhere, so I'm not going to talk about it. But I will talk about three reasons why uh, my colleagues and I think that the FBI's demand in San Bernardino was ill-considered. Legally, what they were asking for is, 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 if you're not in law school, this might go a little over your head, so we'll brush by it quickly. What they were asking for represented a fundamental shift in the way that the American court system interpreted the All Writs Act, which was passed in 1791. That was the law that the FBI was, uh, uh, was relying on uh, to grossly oversimplify no court had ever ordered, for instance, Brinks, the safe maker, to make a master key to its safe. Uh, and that's essentially what the FBI was asking for. Technically, what the FBI was asking was flawed because you know we barely understand how to make secure systems. And what the FBI was asking for was for Apple to undermine its own security. And that seems a little bit crazy. Uh, and then from a policy point of view, what the FBI was asking for was, of course, not necessarily a master key with which they could get into any device, but the ability to demand that Apple create a master key to get into any particular device. Um, from a policy perspective, let's assume for the sake of argument we think the FBI is perfect. Great, I'll admit that for the sake of argument. Uh, how is Apple going to resist similar demands from Brazil, from Turkey, from India, from China, from Russia, from Turkmenistan? You name it, right? They're of course not. If Apple wants to do business in China, it's going to have to give the Chinese everything they give the Americans. And if they are consistent and say no to the FBI, that gives them at least a little bit of cover to the Chinese, to the Russians, to the Turks. Uh, but if they say yes to the FBI, all of a sudden it's blown. And of course, the FBI didn't want to think about that, didn't want to think about what would happen uh, in, in the international sphere. They, only, they thought that they could keep this um, in the United States. Uh, I'm going to breeze by the wiretap uh, accreditation only to say that uh, there's a case somewhere in the country, we don't know the status of it, ordering WhatsApp to decrypt text message content. WhatsApp is not capable of doing so. We don't know what happens in this case. Uh, it's totally under seal. Speaking of cases that are under seal, who the hell knows what the FISA court is doing? Right? The FISA court is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. It sits in a basement in the courthouse in Washington, D.C., and actually meets within a Faraday cage uh, to, to expound on the level of security there. Um, we're in the middle of a FOIA case, a Freedom of Information Act case, to get access to any FISA court orders that touch on encryption. Uh, the, right now, the Department of Justice is holding the line that you're all familiar with that can neither confirm nor deny that any such orders exist. Uh, last year, we saw my Senator Dianne Feinstein and Senator Richard Porter from North Carolina introduce a bill that would have done the FBI's dirty work. This was the fallback position from San Bernardino. Um, of course, the FBI didn't actually let the case in San Bernardino play out. Literally on the eve before the court hearing uh, in San Bernardino, the FBI dismissed the case and uh, found a contractor willing to sell them an O'Day to get into the phone. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, I am indeed a cynical man. I don't actually believe they found the unlock to the iPhone on the literal eve of the court hearing. Uh, I think they realized that they were going to lose and didn't want the precedent, and so pulled the plug on the location. Um, but this was their fallback position. This was, if they had lost in court, this is what they were going to go for. Um, this bill never actually got formally introduced, so we don't have a bill number or a name. Um, everyone just calls it the Burr-Feinstein bill. Uh, and it would have required uh, companies to turn over plain text on demand for anything, essentially. Uh, both civil and criminal penalties, it applied to communications platforms, it applied to storage, both online and offline, and weirdly, it applied to licensing. Why does that matter? 
because it applied to the app stores and the open source world as well. If this had passed, it would have essentially outlawed the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, GitHub, um, and not, it wasn't just end-to-end -end encryption and full disk encryption. The way that the bill was worded, if you read it literally, outlaws general purpose computing. Yay! Um, so that's problematic on all sorts of levels. It's number one, unconstitutional. Remember, code is speech. Uh, so the First Amendment says you can't ban encryption code. Number two, it would break the internet. You simply can't have a system uh, where every provider is required to have access to plain text. Um, it would cripple American business who's going to buy an American product when it's guaranteed to have an NSA backdoor. Uh, and of course, it would be totally ineffective. Uh, you can't actually put the encryption cat back in the bag. Uh, it's out, right? All you have to do is go to a library, check out a book, uh, and you can learn the fundamentals of PKI uh, and Diffie Hellman, and there you go, you're off the run. So, what about today? What does Trump have to say? Uh, we don't really know what Trump has to say. We can read, we, we, can, we can listen to him. Uh, but your parsing is as good or better than mine. Um, you know, he says, to think that Apple won't allow us to get into her cell phone, uh, her, I'm not sure her, her is. is one, of the, one of the terms. Yeah, but it wasn't, it was his cell phone. Anyway, um, I think he actually may have been referring to a kidnap and murder victim in Louisiana in this, but we don't actually know. Uh, who do they think they are? No, we have to open it up. And he actually repeated that several times, we have to open it up. It up. Um, of course, we know that. Oh, and he also called for a boycott. <laughs> Great, but uh, that didn't. You know, he uses an iPhone, so who the hell knows what that? Means. Uh, Jeff Sessions, our current Attorney General, when he was a senator, said that encryption serves many valuable and important purposes. It's also critical, however, that national security and criminal investigators be able to overcome encryption under lawful authority when necessary to the furtherance of national security. In criminal investigations, uh, one of the uh, one of the often quoted uh, just joke actually out of Australia is when Australia passed its anti-encryption regulation, the prime minister was the prime minister was the attorney general, but the attorney general uh, was was asked, you know, how how can Australia require backdoors into everything? When you can just go get a math textbook off the shelf and, uh, and, and, and figure out how to write software without a backdoor. And what, uh, what the Australian Attorney General said was well, in Australia, the laws of Australia apply irrespective of what the laws of mathematics say. <laughs> okay. So the laws of mathematics say that, that you can't have secure backdoor crypto. Uh, tell that to Jeff Sessions, tell that to our Attorney General and the Australian Attorney General, because apparently that's news to them. So, what are we actually looking at in, uh, in 2018? What, what, I, I'm a lawyer, I'm not going to make uh, predictions, except for, for you, you're lucky, I'm going to make predictions for you. What are we actually looking at? Um, are we looking at a key escrow mandate like we saw with the Clipper chip? I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I think Congress, oh god, I hate them about to say this. I think Congress isn't dumb enough to do this. <laughs> um, but you know, whatever, I've been proven wrong before. What about Bert, Bert Einstein? Are we looking at a bill like that? Uh, again, no. Uh, I, I'm going to say it again. Congress isn't dumb enough to pass a law that would ban general purpose computing. At least I hope not. What about a mandate that says, we don't care how you do it, just make plain text available when we come knocking? This, I think, is a whole lot more likely. Um, that's the tack that the UK is taking, for instance. Uh, the Investigatory Powers Bill doesn't ban encryption. All it says is, uh, you, for values of you that include hardware manufacturers, application developers, and service providers, just have to give us plain text. Uh, and if you can't give us plain text, you're going to jail, essentially. Um, but of course, I don't believe that any of these mandates are going to work better today than they did the last time around. 
1986, you could just click the, tech, the checkbox uh, that, that said, I live in the US. Um, the, the, the laws that are, the, the frameworks, the legal frameworks that we're living in um, that can prevent encryption are the same frameworks that, can, that, are, that were created to prevent centrifuges or scud missiles or landmines from leaving the United States. But information doesn't respect borders, and you can't stop computer code at the border. You live in a world with strong crypto. Uh, and just like it was ineffective to have a checkbox uh, to say whether or not you wanted the strong crypto back in 1996, you know, now we have things that can actually get you there. Right? We have Tor, we have GPG, we have Signal. Uh, those things aren't going away. They're here to stay, and any law enforcement proposal that pretends that those don't exist, um, I would uh, be very skeptical. Uh, at the very end of the last conference, uh, or last Congress in 2016, um, the House Judiciary Committee uh, put out a report. Uh, we were extremely pessimistic about this report. Uh, the House Judiciary Committee is controlled by Bob Goodlatte, a, a Republican congressman, um, but we were very pleasantly surprised. Uh, and the committee um, laid out a few observations. Weirdly, EFF agrees with them all. Any measure that weakens encryption works against the national interest. Okay, and that's what the Ninth Circuit said back in 1998 in the Bernstein case. Encryption technology is a global technology widely increasingly available around the world. Right? We knew that from the 90s as well. We had OpenBSD based in Canada. Uh, we had t-shirts being worn through airports. Um, now, of course, there's a whole bunch of uh, some of the best crypto work going on in the world is going on outside the United States. Part of that is because cryptographers feel legally threatened, but part of that is because people live all around the world and they're just as smart as we are at Foxman. Third observation from the uh, the variety of stakeholders create different divergent challenges with respect to encrypto and the going dark phenomenon. And therefore, there is no one-size-fits-all uh, solution to the encryption challenge. Uh, to, to me, that should be self-evident, but not to Jim Comey or Christopher Wray, uh, and probably not to Trump, I can't really tell you what his feelings are on that one point. Uh, and finally, Congress should foster cooperation between law enforcement and technology companies. Um, I tend to agree with that as well. Uh, but instead, you see Tim Cook hauled up in front of uh, the Oversight Committee and grilled instead of encouraged to work with uh, the FBI and San Francisco. So what's actually likely? What do I predict will actually happen? The biggest one is informal pressure. Uh, as part of my practice at EFF, I represent uh, and I counsel developers and security researchers, including folks who design encryption. Um, I'm mostly barred from telling you who they are, who my clients are, uh, but some of them are, are big names in crypto. And it really does happen that they get uh, a knock on the door, or more, more usually it's a, a telephone call asking for a physical uh, in-person appointment, um, and they always say that it's with the FBI. And then, um, I've actually been to a couple of these. So I show up with my client, and we sit down at the FBI uh, office in San Francisco, and there's an FBI agent and two people who are not FBI agents. And when I ask to see their cards, they, uh, they hand me their beautiful quarterly business cards, uh, because they're, of course, from the NSA. And the pitch, the sales pitch here is, uh, if you don't give us a backdoor, blood will be on your hands. And they usually push a, a piece of paper with a photograph or a message board post, uh, usually in Arabic, uh, extolling the virtues of, of my client's crypto software uh, in an ISIS forum or uh, you know, showing that supposedly uh, crypto is used in some horrible attack. I have no idea how accurate that is. Uh, and sometimes it works. Right? If, uh, if a cryptographer is savvy enough to have an EFF lawyer, it probably is not going to work on them. Um, but most cryptographers are not. And so my guess is informal pressure works a lot, even if there's no court order. Uh, I actually don't think that any ban is going to reach open source software. I think that would just be uh, 
I think that would fall so quickly uh, in front of the First Amendment that um, we're not going to see any ban that reaches the level of cryptographic primitives or, um, or protocols. Yeah. Wouldn't it also be practically impossible to I mean, a copy of the source scope in SSL or on an innumerable number of computers out there? Of course. But just because it's just because it's impractical doesn't mean Congress isn't going to try. <laughs> but uh, my my hope is that the lobbyists from Google and Apple and from companies like Merrill Lynch and Goldman Sachs and Ford and GM will say uh, that this is crazy. We can't do it. Um, okay, a Kalia-like mandate. I think this is this is plausible. So CALEA is the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. Uh, CALEA is the law that requires the phone company to provide wiretap capability uh, to the cops. Uh, they're able that that passes First Amendment scrutiny because it's the because and only because it's the phone company. The phone company essentially, and this is oversimplifying, is a government monopoly, and the government is allowed to dictate what phone companies do. Uh, a lot more than they're able to dictate uh, what non-regulated industries do. So a law that says something like uh, no cell phone provider shall allow a device onto their network that ships with full disk encryption by default, that would be plausible. Uh, it wouldn't work, because all you'd have to do is go to the app store and download WhatsApp. Um, but it would at least get you to iMessage and to to full disk encryption. Um, I think even though the, the actual, the worst of the worst, the terrorists, the pedophiles, the organized crime, are going to be able to easily get around something like that, uh, street criminals won't, and I think the FBI might be satisfied um, if that's all they get. Uh, of course, countries around the world will continue to do dumb things. Uh, Kazakhstan, the Kazakhstans of the world will ask you to install their certificate in your trust store. China and the UK have already done really dumb things. It'll be interesting to see where China goes from here, uh, whether China um, freaks out once Facebook integrates end-to-end -end encryption into Facebook Messenger more than they already have, or, uh, or things like WhatsApp become more common, or iMessage, right? iMessage is up and running in China. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they deal with uh, continued litigation is a definite possibility. As I alluded to earlier, there, we know there are cases going on, we just don't know where or in at what stage, uh, because they're going on in secret. So I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna, this is, again, so against my nature. I'm going to reach across the aisle to uh, Representative Goodlap, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, Republican congressman from Virginia for no obscenity. Um, and he's right when he says that this is an exceedingly difficult problem to address. Uh, it's not privacy versus security, it's privacy and security. Uh, it's clear that more security, not less, is needed to make sure that people and businesses are protected. Um, I absolutely agree with that. I hope that clear heads like Goodlatte uh, win out against uh, folks like the former director of the FBI, Jim Comey. Um, and I hope that, uh, that you guys will keep thinking about crypto, and if you have any questions, go to EFF.org, or ask them right now. Yes? So what do you think about large advertising companies need for personal data to do their advertising? Uh, how is that going to play off against wanting a data encryption? We saw with Google, Google Ads, saying, oh, it's going to be fully in a decrypted well. Kind of, you can make things cognito cap by default, they didn't do it. Facebook Messenger is the same thing, sort of. Mm -hmm. it's you big for it, but by default, it's not there. You really want that person to add it to the ads. How's that going to play out in the industry when you need to have these big companies fight this legislation? So the, the real answer is we don't know how it's going to play out. We've actually seen messaging content scanned a lot less uh, in the past couple of years. Right? Google doesn't scan Gmail content for ads anymore. They scan it for security, but not for ads. Uh, neither Facebook Messenger nor Google Google Allo, supposedly, um, and there's anecdotal evidence to suggest the opposite, but supposedly don't stand for advertising. Um, content, it's my understanding that content is less important for advertising than behavior, and they can still get behavior no problem with end to end. Um, an interesting 
Uh, and end-to-end -end doesn't necessarily mean that the features are gone either. So look at uh, look at Apple Calendar versus Google Calendar. Uh, with both of them, you can set a calendar uh, alert to go off on your phone when it's time to leave to get wherever you want to be for traffic purposes. The way it works on Google is that Google knows where you are and where you need to be, and will t and what the traffic is in between, and will tell you when it's time to leave. With Apple, your phone knows where you are, and your phone knows where you need to be, and your phone pulls the traffic data, does the calculation on device without Apple ever knowing, and tells you when you need to leave. Uh, so you can, it's, it's more, it's computationally more expensive to do it that way, but it's certainly possible, right? If Google wanted to move their personal assistant AI onto the device, they probably can't with current hardware, but with five years from now hardware, they certainly would be able to. Uh, so we just have to see what the engineers' decisions are. Um, I think it's I think privacy and security are and end-to-end -end encryption are perfectly compatible with today's business models. We just need a little extra work to get there. Other questions? So a lot of these conversations, I've heard generally the concept that uh, either full disk encrypted or end-to-end -end encrypted items would be essentially the only thing beyond the reach of essentially a subpoena, or beyond the reach of, uh, you know, the U.S. government is used to being able to ask for anything, whether it's physical or whether it's, and this is the only thing. So, from your perspective, is there, I guess, a legal precedent for having this kind of privileged communication such that it is entirely secret? Absolutely. That, that is something that is actually beyond the reach of uh, uh, the government asking for it? Absolutely. Uh, the, the concept that all of our communications are open to the government asking for it is a very, very new concept. Um, in, I don't know, 19, in 1975, uh, if I had uh, if I'd been planning a terrorist attack and had done everything in plain text phone calls and plain text snail mail, postal mail, uh, after the fact of the attack, what would the FBI have been able to do? Nothing, right? When I made a phone call, that phone call was gone the second I hung up the phone. When I sent a letter, once that letter was delivered, the content was inaccessible. Right? There's, uh, the Postal Service has something called the Mail Covers Program, where they took photographs of the front and back of every unwelcome postcard. actually still exists, uh, and they keep it for 12 months or so. Um, but what's inside the envelope was secret to them. Uh, so the fact that for the first time ever, not just our contemporaneous communications, right, the FBI got wiretap, they could have listened into my phone calls I was making right then. But now, all of our past communications are open as well. Right? That's new. That is brand new. Um, it used to be if you wanted perfect security, you would just go take a walk in a park with your co-conspirator um, and have that conversation. You would have it face-to-face. -face. Or you would have it on, you know, you'd go to a payphone if you knew that your house was being wiretapped and your, the other person would go to a payphone on their end of town. And you could have a 100% secure analog, plain old copper telephone line conversation. Um, so the, when, when you hear the FBI say we're going dark, they're going dark from a place of incredible transparency. Right? In, in 2009, right, they could see into everything that we were doing. TLS didn't exist, right? or it existed, but it wasn't actually very often. Uh, Genial was in plain text in 2009. Um, so they could do everything. Star TLS didn't exist in 2009. Uh, and, and telephone calls were essentially recorded. You could go, every telephone call was essentially recorded. You could go back and listen to them all. Um, after Snowden, we stopped doing that. Uh, but when you hear the FBI say, uh, you know, we're, we're going dark, we're, going, we're coming to a place that has never existed before, I would push back and say, no, we're going back to exactly the status quo ante before the school of the age of digital surveillance. Uh, and the world didn't end then, it's not going to end now. Any other questions? Yes? What is your personal amount of skepticism for systems that are not publicly audible? Apple's all of their products that don't open source them, they claim to protect their privacy and security, and I'm sure they have. Uh, they get audited privately, but I mean, it's not open source, so you can't go and check it out. How much skepticism do you put toward like Apple? 
Um, so I'm in a privileged position here because I'm good friends with Apple's head of security, and I trust him. Uh, if I wasn't, if I didn't know him, I probably wouldn't have an right? I would probably have an essential phone, a black phone, uh, or no phone at all. Uh, I know the security folks at Google pretty well. Uh, the Chrome security team is awesome, and I know for a fact that they have integrity. But that's because I actually know them as humans, right? They come over to my house and have dinner with me and my wife. Um, for people like for people like you, you got nothing. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's what I was um, interestingly, uh, it's almost impossible to. Uh, is there any talk in this room that I'm holding up? Oh, no, you're good. Oh, yeah. Uh, interestingly, so a lot of the folks that I work with obviously are. Open source evangelists to the nth degree, um, but with maybe one exception, uh, all of them have phones that include massive amounts of closed source software. Right? How how in today's day and age, I dare you to try and run an Android device that doesn't have binary blobs with hard, hardware level access to everything. You can run an open source operating system and use Signal and not use WhatsApp, but you're still at the mercy of closed source software at one end or another. And even if you weren't, you're at the mercy of uh, a completely opaque supply chain. So you don't know what hardware you're running against, right? The company that made your, like Apple, probably knows what most of the hardware in this device is, but certainly not all of it. Um, they don't have, they don't manufacture every chip. Uh, they don't manufacture any of the chips, right? Foxconn or TSMC um, makes their T sends out to yeah, and Samsung and Exynos and whoever else. Uh, Qualcomm, I think there's and Intel's are splitting their their modems between Intel and Qualcomm right now. I think. Um, anyway, all of that stuff Apple doesn't have complete uh, insight into. So we're I don't know we're all at the mercy of a supply chain 100 billion miles long. Both in software and hardware. What are you going to do? So, I mean, following up to that, as consumers, is there any safeguards we can we can demand, or at least try, try to find that possible? Absolutely. Uh, go to EFF.org and just read our blog. We have lots of different ways you can educate. Oh yeah, SSD.EFF.org, which actually we're revamping right now. The new one. Uh, so SSD is our surveillance self-defense guide. Uh, shows you how to use all of the best security tools that exist for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, and we're creating a new version that will be a trainer's guide to train security trainers how to train normal people on these secure tools. Um, and we're very, I'm, I'm just very excited about that. Uh, so my flight home tomorrow, I have a lot of review work to do on that. But, Luckily, there's Wi Fi in the phone. Other questions? Thanks, guys.